Coming to you live from the Business Radio X studio, it's Franchise Marketing Radio. Brought to you by IDS, an award-winning digital marketing agency that delivers integrated marketing solutions for franchisers, franchisees, and franchise development teams. Learn why over 75 brands depend on IDS's team of dedicated marketers and client service professionals to deliver a strong ROI on their marketing investment. Go to idsfranchisemarketing.com for a complimentary digital audit and consultation. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Franchise Marketing Radio, the show where we bring you inspiring conversations with industry leaders and franchise experts. Today, we have a very special guest from the home services franchise sector. Joining us on the show today, we have Michael Morehouse. He's the president of Mosquito Shield, and Mosquito Shield has experienced very remarkable growth. I know that. I've been in this industry a long time. Uh, earning the title of Entrepreneur's Ninth Fastest Growing Franchise for 2023 with 350 territories and a strong presence in the pest control industry. So without further ado, I want to introduce Michael Morehouse. Welcome to the show, Michael. Hey, thanks so much, Rob. Great to be back with you. We spoke a few years ago and a lot's happened since then. So happy to be no, on. No. It's great to be. It's great when I have guys like you back because a lot has happened since then. And I love what we talked about earlier before we went on air and about just some of the reflection that you had back in uh, pre-COVID times. I'd love for you to share a little bit about you know that remarkable growth because when we talked last, I think you were was it under like twenty or fifty or where were you? But it was it was a low number. Now you're at this big number. Tell us about this growth. Well, some of the some of the ideas or some of the things you've learned since. Uh, yeah, so I since- think you and I spent some time together back in 2019, and we probably had about 35 locations at the time. And but having been around for since you know we launched in 2013 as a franchise concept, but been a mosquito control company all the way back to 2001, we knew in late 2019 that we were ready and poised for growth. But more importantly, we thought the industry was ready. There had been some acquisition with some of the other concepts out there, and we just felt that it was a good time to act. And we took the leap and partnered with an FSO because we felt we were operationally prepared and ready to grow. What we didn't know was what the pandemic was going to bring and how it was going to catapult our business. And that was really the perfect storm for us. So we partnered with a real, you know, Franchise Fastlane, which is an amazing franchise sales organization. They have a really incredible process. I handled every single franchise owner from day one up until partnering with them. So to hand that over to somebody was really tough for me to do. And I needed it to be somebody that I really trusted their process. And that was the relationship we built with Fastlane. And we launched with them in March of 2020, right days before, you know, the pandemic hit. And for a few weeks, it was certainly on, you know, there was a lot of uncertainty about what was going to happen, but we were blessed to be considered an essential service in every state we were in. And that just meant that our franchisees could still operate. And then they just started to thrive. You know, the homeowners couldn't go anywhere except in their backyard. So for our franchisees, they had just a huge opportunity to grow their business. The other side of that on the on the Fran Dev side of it was people were home and they had the chance to think about what they wanted to do with their lives, right? So they started thinking about business opportunity because they had this time to do that. So it was just really the perfect storm for Mosquito Shield during that time. And that's what led to this last, you know, almost 36 months now of just epic, epic growth. I mean, it's, you, you probably feel weird saying that about yourself. <laughs> About, about your brand, right? It's, For sure. Uh, but it is. But it is happening. I mean, it's like if, if I were, I'm sure Franchise Fastlane would love to share, they share your story with a lot of people um, uh, because it's a great story. Uh, but tell me a little bit about, like we, like we said, 35 locations. And I love what you said, by the way. I want to point that out. And that you said that we were, we were in business since 2001. You guys have worked hard at this for a long time. And, you know, it's not like, you know, we, we look at it and say, oh my goodness, you grew like in three years, four years, but you've been at it a long time. And you, you really took your time to say, I think we're ready. I think we're ready. And we see an opportunity, but then something occurred that made it a bigger opportunity that none of us could control, which is a great thing. But tell me a little bit about, you know, going from 35 to 350. Tell me a little bit about the things that you have learned along the way. Is there 
what, is there some things that you've done that are different that you feel now that you, you I know that you have some viable competitors, right? Um, and the industry is a, it's a great model. It's a great, it's a great concept and you have competitors. Well, what is it do you think that, that put you in that situation where you could really show everybody what makes you guys unique and led to that growth? Yeah, there's a, there's a lot there if I can try to unpack some of it, because I think one part that's super important to me is, and this would be helpful to any sort of like emerging brands out there would be, you know, think of what you want the first 10 or 20 owners to look like in your, in your, in your franchise concept, because ideally they're the foundation and they're the ones that are going to help you both with validation, right? So as you're going through friend of validation, super important, somebody considering a franchise opportunity is going to want to talk to existing franchisees. So you need them in your corner, right? You need to have served them well and given them an opportunity. So that's super important. And, you know, what I, what I'm really proud of is, you know, nine out of our original 10 locations are still in operation today. And I think it's 17 out of the first 20. Right. So if you look back now at those people, they are still today the ones that are, you know, waving the flag and, and you know, bleeding black and red. And, and, and there there are stakeholders and we lean on them at 350 units, you know, like we did when we had 10 and 12. And, you know, when you go to your first franchise show ever trying to sell unit number one and everyone comes up and says, well, how many locations do you have? I quickly learned that I had to say, you know, several under development. Like I had to have something to say, right? Because uh, this was 10 years ago when we had zero. So when I look back at the people that took that leap of faith with us back then, I recommend or I encourage franchisee, franchisors that are starting out to take that mentality and really think about where you're going to be down the road and, and be selective. And I think that that's where we were able to grow the way we did is that we had built a model that there were times over the first five or six years, Rob, that we pumped the brakes, right? So when we launched in 2013, we had a goal of, uh, I think it was, it was 10 franchisees in the first 18 months, and we had 14 in the first 12 months. So we shattered the the projections that our consultants had used with us to um, to launch this business in 2013, and we stopped. We stopped FranDev for about eight months because we had grown faster than we had planned, and we really wanted to make sure that we were growing internally with our support team as fast as we were growing and adding new locations. And we did that a couple of times over that six year period. So we would pump the brakes. On, on development and make sure we were ready. And that's the point I mentioned when we got to 2019 and we saw what was happening in the industry, we could not predict what was right around the corner, but we knew we were ready to, to really turn it on because we had so many sound systems in place. Again, mm -hmm. harnessing that, you know, at that point, it was probably about 18 years worth of you know, knowledge in this space and really being the pioneers of mosquito control we knew that we were ready to take it to the masses. And that's that's when we partnered with Fastlane. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, a lot of thought goes into business models. And 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 regardless of all these factors, um at the end result, you you were able to launch, you know, whatever that number is, 320 businesses in in, in just a few years. And there has to be something about, like you said, processes and systems, but the model, the thinking about the model ahead of time, thinking, starting with the end in mind, in order to do these and be efficient and, and be able to expand quickly, there has to be something about the model. So I guess what I'm saying is, how do you guard against complexity? Most businesses struggle as they grow because they get more complicated, right? You guys thought about it ahead of time and said, we're going to build a model that has some simplicity to it, but it's profoundly impactful to the customer. And, and the profitable to us, but there's some thought that goes into that. So what are the key things that you think about your model, maybe comparing to other home services or even restaurants or other models? What is it that makes it possible to even do that kind of growth that fast and do it well? Where you're yeah, it's it's a, thriving? It's, no, it's a great question. Cause I think one of the things is it's not, uh, you know, mosquito shield can't take credit for all of it because some of it is just the home service space in general tends to lend itself to more simplistic models, especially, in our system where you know you can start as a home-based business so that takes a lot of complexity out of it when you're not trying to find real estate and negotiating leases and build outs and you know that's a whole different complex thing the other thing that is so powerful for our brand is 
It's a recurring revenue model. So we have an extremely high retention rate, industry leading with more customers of ours coming back year after year. And that's that's it's recurring revenue that you can count on. So you have a lot of people coming back year after year. So you can afford a higher acquisition cost. You know, I can spend more money to get Rob to come on as a customer because Rob's going to be there every year after that indefinitely, you know, at, at the full price. So those are things that make this super scalable is it's low cost of entry. You don't need a brick and mortar to start. Uh, it's one technician in the first truck in year one, and then you're only adding a technician after that. So as your business grows and you're adding multiple trucks, it's still that one person in the office. We've built such an infrastructure here. We've got an in-house sales center. We've got an in-house marketing team. So you don't, as a business owner, all you really need to think about is servicing servicing the hell out of your customers, taking care of them right as best as you possibly can. And doing the marketing tactics that we, you know, um, lay out for you to help make the phone ring, but we handle everything from there. So we've automated it over the years, and, and you know, credit to the founder who uh, had a really large lawn care business for years. And when I sat down with him, and I, I literally said, "Tell me everything you like about being in in a lawn care franchise, and tell me everything you don't like." And that's what I tried to build Mosquito Shield around: is keep as many of the likes and leave out as many as the dislikes. He hated accounts receivables. So, you know, 10 years ago when we launched, we didn't have we didn't hang invoices on the door like law care companies to this day still do. It was a it was a prepay or an easy pay, you know. So we streamlined things that now is still kind of uh cutting edge, but our franchisees just benefit from going into a business where there's no receivables. The money's in the money's in the bank or there's a card on file. So that type of stuff is it. I think we've gotten a little bit, um, you use the word complacent, but you know we have to keep challenging ourselves internally because we, we launched so far ahead of the curve and you know um, we've kind of paved the road for a lot of other businesses. So now it's just making sure that we don't rest on that and what, you know, what do we bring next? What do we introduce? But for our franchisees that have come in, it's a pretty scalable model because of those efficiencies that were built from day one. I, I, it's just, it's mind blowing to say, like when you solve problems that people didn't know they had, right. Or they didn't experience it yet in life. But, you know, it's those little things that churn so much time and inefficiency. And it could be something as simple as streamlining a bill process. Right. Yeah, definitely. Um, it's those little, those little levers uh, that you pull in the business, but it's knowing which ones matter the most. Right. And and you can't really do that without a lot of scale and a lot of experience, right? And that's what you benefit from when you buy into a franchise brand, especially one that has has achieved what you have with so many different locations. So, but tell me, I know that the industry you weren't obviously the first player to the industry. You mentioned, you know, that in 2019 you saw an opportunity. There's some change changes in your industry. You saw an opportunity to be a different, a, you know, a, maybe a brand that was just a little different, maybe a little better. But what is that differentiator? If you could hone it in when you're talking to somebody for the first time that's getting to know your brand and that maybe they've looked at some of your competitors, what are those differentiators you try to focus on for them? Yeah, I love it. There's there's two different angles that I like to talk about on this because there's you considering a business opportunity. So how are we different than the others, right? So bigger territories, lower fees, that was always been our, our model. We're going to give you more and charge you less for it, right? So that was always a... Um, a differentiator on the business opportunity side, the, you know, so lower brand fund, lower royalties and a bigger footprint. That was always, we never wanted a mom and pop business model, right? We didn't want, you know, a bunch of single unit, one van businesses running around. We wanted them to be able to scale, to have eight, 10, 12 trucks. We've got locations now that are running 20 plus trucks. So that is that's what we've always aspired to so we made sure that when they bought a territory it was big enough to support that so when you compare us to other franchise models in the in this space you're getting a bigger territory and your fees are less so that was the big differentiator and we really we did really harp on the the 20 years because there's a lot of franchise companies getting into mosquito control rob we're a mosquito control company that got into franchising 
Right. And what that brings with it is those high retention rates that I talked about. Eight and a half out of every 10 customers are coming back every year. And then they're, yeah. they're, they're referring at a really high rate. So word of mouth is through the roof. So those are the things that make us really strong and, and separate. And then the second side of it is how do we differentiate at the B2C level? So when a consumer is in their backyard getting bothered by it and they get on their phone, how do, how do we differentiate as a brand? And that list is long because, again, 20 years of experience tells us you can't control mosquitoes on a 21-day program like everyone else sells. We come out every 10 to 17 days based on monitoring weather and mosquito population. So right on our website, we're telling the consumer you're getting more visits, better results for less money. So that's the yeah. that, that's the way to really, for us to differentiate. We're going to come out more often. It's going to work better. And we actually charge less. And the, re- the reason we're able to do that is we spend less time on a property and we use less product, but it's the know-how that allows us to, to do that more effectively. So there's a lot of efficiencies that we already talked about, but those, those have a, a end use benefit to the consumer because their price is less money for the season than with others. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm sure, and, 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 and as you're describing that, I'm just thinking, yeah, I mean, I, I would pay for the script you just, you just shared, right? Like that, that, that almost anyone would buy into that. I'm like, this guy knows his stuff. I didn't know there was so much to know about mosquitoes, but he knows his stuff, right? And I'm only paying for what I need. And that everybody loves that faster, better, cheaper is, is, is clear, right? It, it's a clear value proposition. Uh, but just having that nailed down is, is something that's mm-hmm. special. So you're at 350 units and, you know, obviously there's, there's growth to, to come. How do you determine that as president? Like, you know, how do you look at the United States and say, we're going here, here, or, or there? Is there, do you prioritize markets a certain way based on certain factors? Or is it mainly, hey, where we have openings, where there's enough population, we're good to go? Uh, well, how does that look for you as far as expanding? Yeah, some of that is a little bit self-leveling or even self-fulfilling because the the climate for mosquito control is you know i've always joked for years and years that you need three things to be successful in mosquito control uh bugs water and money right so where where are the where are those three and they don't have to be proportionate but where they're bugs water and money you're going to do well in this business so um you know eastern seaboard the south the lake regions like that's self-explanatory and that's where all of our initial growth started from we're from massachusetts so initially we obviously grew in, in the northeast and then down the eastern seaboard but then we immediately started getting inquiries from you know the lake regions michigan minnesota where there's just a very short season but you can't step outside so the service is in so high demand there uh that you know you can't help but be, you know, you can't help but succeed and really provide a very valuable service to people. So when we launched, you know, I started the process in 2011. It took me about 18 months to build everything to go live in 2013. But we identified back then 39 states that had an above average mosquito problem where we felt we could make some inroads. Um, And back then there was only one national competitor at the time. So we knew the, the market was wide open. You know, but on that list was not California, where we're thriving right now with mosquito control 10 years later. On that list, you know, Arizona was not on that list. And it is now a spot with, you know, mosquito trouble. So it, in the 10 years time, so much has changed. But, you know, your, you know, your question of like, how do you determine growth and where, you know, the markets that you're going after, we're looking at, um, you know, densely populated areas. I think what's going to happen is, you know, when we're, we're, you know, I think we're at like 364 locations right now. And we still have some amazing prime territory available, surprisingly. But, you know, we project in the next 12 to 18 months that a lot of those will be taken and we'll be looking at now secondary markets. Mm-hmm. And then does that mean a different business model? Do we change, you know, do we change the structure altogether? You know, do we come up with like a, um, a a secondary agreement that, you know, it's got different revenue requirements, it's got different fees, you know, lower fees to get in because the upside may not be as high, but still a huge demand and maybe a great bolt on for somebody that's got another small side business. So there's a whole nother, I think, growth trajectory for us in some of those secondary markets. But we believe we still have about 100 to 125 prime market uh, territories available. Wow. 
uh, if I were anyone listening and you're even a little bit interested, you better pick the phone up. Um, because that is one of the factors with all this is that when you find brands that do have those, those ingredients, uh, as an investor, you have to realize that it is a finite resource. It There's is. Only so many. Yeah. There's so it, many little pieces. Sales pitch. It, yeah. The, the urgency, you know, um, is the reality of it. it, takes care of itself. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it is what it is. But I, I'm such a huge believer. I love franchising because it's like what you said earlier. It's like, we're not going to launch till we're ready. There's only so many resources, but it's all about success. Everybody has to win. I see everybody has skin in the game. So to me, it's, it's, yeah, but one of the downsides is there's only so many of these that can go around, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so, but, but does, does the question of seasonality come up or, or is that sort of just, it just the numbers of the numbers? Or do people often ask, well, what do you do when it's not summer or when it's not, you know, so is there other things that you guys are doing or is it just the revenue model is what it is and you enjoy, maybe that you don't have as much to do at certain points of the year. Like, how does that work for you guys? Yeah, it's a double-edged sword. So we have gotten a lot better over the years, making sure that our candidates come in recognizing the first two seasons are the toughest because they're not open for a straight 12-month run, right? So we'll use Minnesota again for an example. If you come on, if you come on now in Minnesota, you're not even opening until next May, right? So you're going to buy a franchise now and their season's ending. They got another couple of weeks of spray season in Minnesota, and then, you know, that's it for them. So you're going to buy now. You're not going to open until May. You're going to close in September. You will have owned a franchise for a year, and you will have only sprayed for four or five months. So you got to get through the first two years to make sure that you uh, – we want to make sure you can sustain the first two years. It's a blessing and a curse. The curse is those first two seasons. The blessing is down the road, you're making 12 months revenue in five or six months' time. So it's just, do you have the staying power to get there? And we really try to prep you for that, tell you what the first two years are going to be like. But then from there, it just starts to scale pretty quickly. We've dabbled in and we do well with, you know, we have a lot of franchisees that we support with uh, holiday lighting, which is a good transition for them to, um, they stop spraying in October and they start putting lights up if they choose. But I've got some of our largest locations that, you know, when asked, how come you don't do the lighting? They say, because we don't have to. <laughs> they, they, they don't have to do anything. And like, why? Uh, why would you? Right. And, you know, truthfully, like you need a couple months to decompress because this is fast and furious for a very short amount of time. Again, if you look at a 12 month business, you're pacing it out. You'll have some ebbs and flows during the holidays, maybe, or different holidays, depending on your business model, where you'll know it's going to be a little busier for a long weekend or maybe a week's time here and there. In mosquito control, it's 300 miles an hour from May to July, and then it'll start to slow down a little bit. But you know, when October comes, you can finally you know recharge your batteries and decompress a little bit. So some don't want to do anything at that point. I think it's fantastic to me for my personality. I would love to have the extra time to diversify what I do or, or uh, just whatever, I decompress, just relax. But, but the bottom line is I think that's a huge value, right? The only downside of that would be you didn't make enough in the three or four, four months or five months, you know? And if, if you're making a year's worth of money in five months, to me, that's an advantage, no matter how you look at that. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, so that's good stuff. Well, is there like, as we're, we're in this world, where there's endless stuff going on with technology, right? And uh, of course, AI is in the news, um, and, and we've got all this stuff going on with advancements in technology. How do you see that playing into your business or in home services? Is there anything that you have your eyes on? It may not maybe specifically uh, AI, but <clears throat> is there anything you have your eyes on in terms of technology that would kind of do what you said earlier, where it would really be a game changer? for operations or for marketing or anything like that or yeah I mean, I mean, AI, yeah, yeah. ai is playing a huge role rob on the marketing front and and we've got a pretty talented team um leveraging that you know you can i think you can take any of this um ai generated content and immediately have something 70 percent correct right you, you still need the you need in my opinion that the you need to humanize that content to get it to the hundred percent where you want it and where it should be for your brand. So that's an efficiency there if you're leveraging it correctly. And I think we're all learning that and trying to get better and really still understanding that whole world of AI. But that certainly brings a lot to the marketing front of things. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, operationally, I mean, there's things like we, 
you know, we've been um, we've been sort of leading the way in testing a lot of new uh, battery op equipment. Um, that's just not where it needs to be. Again, everything we do is really around results. We're not going to use a battery operated backpack sprayer if it doesn't atomize the product, distribute it as well, and give us the give the same coverage that our you know loud, smelly, gas powered ones do. But yeah. it's those loud, smelly ones that provide better results right now. You know, so we are uh, we're continually testing um, battery op equipment. So that's probably the only thing on the operation side that is, you know, from a technology standpoint, we're the only ones, Rob, with our own proprietary blender product. So that's something that we have always done and will always continue to do. So that is always at our um, on our you know uh, on our plate as far as making sure that we're continually advancing those products, testing new ones. Yeah. We're running tests year after year with locations and doing tens of thousands of sprays with different uh, product formulations and just always taking the best of the results and then you know launching with that the next year and then enhancing that. So product is always something that we are um, you know we're playing around with. Uh, so that's something that I wouldn't consider to be new. It'd be, you yeah. know. Well, I, I love the answer, though. Just in what you're saying, I'm thinking to myself, you know, <clears throat> I'm running a business. I, I want to help my customers. And I'm thinking, what local business owner would think about formulations, right? Like you're you're going to test different formulations, different ways just to see if you can, you know, get some kind of value or economic benefit or whatever. And and I think, again, that's that doesn't get lost on me how important that is, is what I'm saying. That's great. Yeah. And I think that, that you asked about differentiators earlier, people considering some of these different business opportunities regardless of the industry you're looking at so if you're you know i encourage everyone to pursue business ownership i really love the franchise model and i know you do as well because of that support the structure that sort of business in a box that you get the trial and error that you don't have to go through so i really really love these formats to just even if it's not mosquito control or mosquito shield specifically but it inspires somebody to look into a business opportunity but i do I really encourage people to consider things that have some sort of proprietary edge, you know, because it, it just is, it gives you a leg up in a super competitive field that you might, you know, find yourself in and a differentiator in the eyes of whoever your end user is. So mm -hmm. if you can have something or find a business that offers something that is just unique to them within a certain space that you're interested in, I'd lean in that direction. That's incredible advice. Um, uh, I, I I use that sort of thinking with a lot of things in my life when I'm trying to decide, you know, what what to, who to work with, what tools to use, uh, you know, who to rely on. Uh, that that's great advice um, because you know, they have to have staying power, right? The people you work with and 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 mm -hmm. who you represent or refer to or uh, whatever. So it's interesting. I, I do I analyze companies that way. So it's great advice. Um, so in terms of getting to know you guys a little better, maybe reaching out, like we said, you, you only have so many prime territories left. So how do they get a hold of you? What's the best way to reach out? What's with, uh, what's the yeah. So, do? so two things, most shield franchise. So MO shield franchise.com is the franchising website. So that, uh, and there's a, you know, learn more contact form there that you can fill out that will, you know, come directly to us. Uh, and I, anytime I get a chance to be in, in this type of environment with somebody like yourself that is such an advocate for franchising, um, Michael at MoShield.com is my direct email. If anyone ever has any, you know, interest in learning about franchising in general, you know, or brainstorming or uh, emerging franchisors that, you know, want to go on an epic run and want to know what that looks like. I'm always available to uh, to chat with somebody. So reach out to me directly, you know, Michael at MoShield.com. But if you want to learn more about the franchising opportunity, it's MoShieldFranchise.com. And if you're a homeowner that wants to enjoy the last few months of the season, go to, exactly. go to yeah, go to MoShield.com. And, and there's a way better chance now than in 2019 when you and I talked that we'll be covering your area if you go onto our website and take a look. So um, MoShield.com is our consumer site. There you go. Yeah, you know, I'm. Uh, uh, I have to say, I'm in Colorado, so I'm sure Colorado wasn't on your top list in terms of humidity here, and not in water. Um, yeah, you know, but, I, I, 
tell you a really quick story about Colorado. So yeah, I, yeah. I, uh, I've done well over the years with um, doing the the little regional franchise and business opportunity expos. And yeah. um, I did one out in Colorado. So it was a two day, like a Friday, Saturday expo, but with the same company that I've done it with for years, uh, national event management, great guys. And uh, I did the show, set the booth up and the doors open, people flock in and, and this couple came up to the booth and said, oh, thank God you're here. And I went on to tell them all about the business opportunity. And fortunately, they were the first couple that walked up because the next one that walked up, they looked at me and they said, why are you here? We don't have mosquitoes in Colorado. So the whole weekend was every other, you know, not literally, but it seemed like every other couple. So depending on where you live in the Mm -hmm. state, elevation yeah. what whatever um yeah. but man if that other couple had come up first i would have been so deflated having you know spent all that money traveled all the way out there set up and the first couple walks up and says what are you doing here i would have said i'm probably leaving you know but right 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 but yeah. i was going to say that, that you know your service is extremely valuable because i moved here that was one of the things on my list of saying like what are the pros and cons of Colorado? No mosquitoes. Like that was a that was on the list somewhere. It wasn't the number one reason, but it's an important one. So I yeah. could see where, where people would want to call you uh so doing funny. that kind of year. So anyway, good stuff. Um, I appreciate you. I appreciate you taking the time and sharing valuable insights. It's again when people like you talk, people should tune in because you're saying things that are matter of fact that are really re- profoundly helpful if if someone is related or interested in in starting a business or in your industry. So thank you for that, Michael. I appreciate your time today. No, I appreciate you, Rob. 